Hi everyone, this is Ranjit, back with another video in the Geom Algolib series. In this video, we are going to learn how to clip a mesh with a plane. Just to demonstrate what it means to clip a mesh with a plane, I have this bunny mesh imported into Rhino and I have this clipping plane here. When I move this clipping plane over to the left like this, the mesh gets clipped. All the faces of the mesh that are to the right side of the plane are not shown anymore. And all the faces of the mesh that are to the left side of the plane are visible the same as they were before. And the faces that actually intersect the clipping plane, they get clipped and you only see parts of those faces, not the whole face. My guess would be that Rhino is doing this in its rendering pipeline somehow. I mean, it probably isn't actually modifying the original mesh, but just, you know, playing this trick in its rendering pipeline to show only part of the mesh. But we are going to try and think of this as a mesh operation. And we will go through the algorithm that takes the original mesh and a plane as the input and outputs a clipped mesh as the result. Now let's figure out how this algorithm is going to work. Let's start with a plane. We will define the plane with a point on the plane and a normal. Now imagine there were a bunch of points around this plane, some behind the plane, some in front of the plane, just randomly distributed around the plane. We need to figure out how to tell whether a point is behind the plane or in front of the plane. To do this, we get the vector that joins the point to the point on the plane. We then get the perpendicular distance of the point from the plane. We calculate this perpendicular distance as the dot product of the vector with the normal of the plane. And this distance is either positive or negative depending on whether the point is in front of the plane or whether the point is behind the plane. So this is called a signed distance. And the sign of the distance tells us which side of the plane the point is in. What this means is if we have some vertices and triangles in the front of the plane, we just ignore those vertices and triangles. And if we have some vertices and triangles behind the plane, we can just copy those vertices and triangles directly into our resulting clipped mesh because those are completely unaffected by the clipping operation. But it is slightly more complicated to deal with the faces that intersect the plane. Let's use this triangle as an example. Let's number the vertices of the triangle as 0, 1, and 2. Let's number the edges of the triangle continuing the same numbering that we used for the vertices as 3, 4, and 5. So you might be wondering why do the edge numbers start from 3 instead of 0, but it will become clear in the end, so just stick with me for now. Now imagine a plane that goes something like that. Now vertices 1 and 2 would get clipped completely, and only vertex 0 would survive the clipping operation. The clipped triangle would be much smaller than the triangle that we started with, with vertices 1 and 2 replaced by new vertices on edges 3 and 5. So we could represent the resulting clipped triangle with indices 0, 3, and 5, where 0 is the original vertex and 3 and 5 are the new vertices, which are just points on the edges of the triangle. But this is just one possible way a plane can intersect this triangle. There are many possible ways a plane could intersect this triangle. So let's go ahead and list all of these possibilities one by one. A triangle has three vertices and each vertex can either be behind or in front of the planes. That means there are two possibilities for each vertex. So the total number of possible states for the triangle as a whole is two to the power of number of vertices, which is two to the power of three, which is eight total possibilities. And that's why you see eight diagrams on the screen right now. Each diagram represents one possible intersection between a triangle and a plane. In the first diagram, all three vertices of the triangle are in front of the plane, which means the whole triangle gets clipped and this triangle will not contribute any vertices or faces to the result mesh. And in the second diagram, the vertices one and two get clipped 
and the smaller triangle defined by the indices 0, 3, and 5 should be copied over to the result mesh, just like the example that we discussed before. Keep in mind that, that the vertex indices 3 and 5 correspond to the vertices on the edges. These are new vertices that we have to add to our mesh. We cannot just copy them over from the input mesh. And in the next diagram, the vertices 0 and 2 get clipped and the smaller triangle defined by the indices 1, 4, and 3 should be copied over to the result mesh. And you know we can apply the same logic to the next diagram, which gives us indices 2, 5, and 4. But for the diagram after that, things are slightly different. The vertex 2 gets clipped, but vertices 0 and 1 survive the clipping operation. In fact, the portion of the triangle that survives the clipping operation is actually a quadrilateral we cannot copy the quadrilateral directly into our result mesh because our mesh can only contain triangles. So we need to split this quad into two triangles and copy over six indices. Six because it's three per triangle and you have two triangles. So we have to copy over all six indices into our result mesh. And that comes out as one, five, and zero for the first triangle and one, four, and five for the next triangle. We are basically splitting the triangle along this diagonal marked in green color. I'm just gonna go ahead and apply the same logic to the next two diagrams, which gives us the indices one, five, three, one, two, and five for the first one, and indices zero, four, three, zero, two, and four for the next one. But for the last diagram, it's actually it's actually not that complicated as the ones before. For the last one, all three vertices of the triangle are behind the plane, which means we just have to copy the whole triangle as it is to the result mesh without modifying it at all. So the indices to be copied are simply 0, 1, and 2. Okay, now that we know all the possible ways a plane can intersect a triangle, the question is, how do we store this information? What data structure is appropriate for storing all of these possibilities? We can represent each of these possibilities using a three-bit integer. Each bit corresponds to one of the vertices of the triangle in order going from right to left. So the first bit represents the side of the plane on which the first vertex lies. Similarly, the second bit represents the second vertex and so on. So let's say the front of the plane is represented by a zero and the back of the plane is represented by a one. For the first diagram, because all three vertices are in front of the plane, the bits are all zero. So the three bit integer is zero, zero, zero. And for the next diagram, only the first vertex is behind the plane, which means the bits are going from right to left, one, zero, and zero. And I'm going to just apply the same logic to all the rest of the diagrams and write down their bitwise integer representations. So if you look at the decimal values of these binary integers, they range from zero to seven. That means we can just store these possibilities in a simple array of length eight and use these bitwise integer representations as the index of that array. So just to recap the entire algorithm, we go over every face of the mesh. We figure out what category that face belongs to, you know, what category among these eight categories that face belongs to. And we just copy over the indices that we listed you know in green color under each of these diagrams to our result mesh if it's case number zero we don't copy anything we just ignore that face completely and if it's any of the other seven possibilities we copy over either one face one triangle or two triangles depending on how it's clipped and once we're done processing all the faces of the input mesh we should have our result mesh which is the clipped mesh. Now let's jump into the code and look at the implementation of this algorithm. This function 
is, you know, where all the action is happening, the whole logic is implemented inside this function. And it returns a clipped mesh, which is allocated on the heap. The function receives the point and the normal as the input parameters. And together, these two things define the plane that is clipping the mesh. So the first step is to calculate the signed distances of all the vertices of the mesh from the clipping plane. And you know we do this using the dot product like we discussed before, and we store all of these signed distances in a vector. The second step is to compute the intersections of the mesh edges with the plane. To do this, we loop over all the edges in the mesh and get the distances of both vertices that we computed in step one and if the product of these distances is positive, that means both distances have the same sign. Like both are either positive or both are negative. Which means both the endpoints of the edge lie on the same side of the plane, which means the edge doesn't actually intersect the plane. So we can just ignore that edge and move on to the next edge. So that's why we continue if the product of the two distances is positive or zero. But if the two distances have different signs, that means the edge actually intersects the plane. So for those cases, we simply use linear interpolation and calculate the intersection point of the edge with the plane and store the resulting intersection point in a local vector. The third step is to compute the bitwise integers for every face in the mesh. To do this, we loop over all the faces in the mesh, check the signed distances of the vertices of the face. Again, we're just going to reuse the distances that we calculated before. We don't have to calculate them again. And by checking the sign of the, uh, the distances, we set the individual bits of the integer. And we just store all of these integers in another vector. In step four, we need to figure out how many triangles our result mesh is going to have. The eight diagrams that we drew earlier tell us exactly how many faces each face of the original mesh contribute to the result mesh. We can store that count in an array, and we can use that array as sort of a lookup table. Like I said before, it's an array of length eight, where the index is our bitwise integer, and the values are the number of vertices that face contributes upon clipping. So we just loop over all the faces, look up the vertex count in our you know, hard-coded array, and add them all up to get the total number of vertices in the resulting mesh. Several of these vertices are shared by adjacent faces, so to avoid duplication, I'm using an unordered map as temporary storage you know, to get rid of the duplicates, but you know, that detail is not really important to understand the algorithm. And in step five, we loop over all the mesh faces one more time. And this time we look up the indices of the triangles for each mesh face based on its bitwise integer value from our lookup table, which contains all the indices that we listed earlier in our diagrams. In this table, we are using X, the value of X is just 255, and we're just using it to pad our indices, you know, some triangles only contribute three indices and some triangles contribute six indices. And we want all, all of the nested arrays to have the same length. So we just use this 255 to pad the arrays that are too short. And yeah, so in our loop, we just copy over these indices into the temporary storage. We Ideally, we shouldn't copy over any of these X values because we copy over the correct number of indices for each face. And one more detail that you have to remember is that these indices are the local indices you know, within the individual triangle. So we have to convert these indices into global indices, which are defined for the whole mesh. So we use this lambda expression to convert the local index into a global index. Uh, you, know, you can see inside the lambda expression that if the local index is either 0, 1, or 2, we just treat them like actual vertices of the mesh of the mesh face because that's what they are. But if the local index is either three, four, or five, we get the appropriate edge intersection point that we calculated and cached before in, in a previous step. So after we've collected all the vertices and indices, we simply create a new mesh instance allocated on the heap and return the pointer. 
So let's build this code and see it in action. I already created a C# -sharp component that calls the C# -sharp function in our project, which in turn calls the C++ function that we just looked at via pinvoke. So we have our bunny mesh here, and we have a plane here that is defined by a point, which I'm able to change it like so, and a normal, which I'm also able to change like so. Now, we run our clipping algorithm, and this is the resulting mesh that we get. And if I, if I modify the plane, I can see the resulting mesh being updated in real time. It looks a bit laggy, but keep in mind that in every iteration, in every, like every time we recom recompute the clipped mesh, we are copying over the mesh data from C Sharp to C++. We are doing this in every iteration, even though the mesh data is the same. And yeah, you have to keep in mind that the responsiveness is actually decent despite this redundant copying that's going on. Okay, so now if I bake the original mesh into into the Rhino document and switch to shaded view, we can clearly see the triangles that are getting clipped. And let's take a look at one of these triangles. The visible portion of the triangle is a quad. So it's getting split into two triangles with a new edge that wasn't there before in the input mesh, which is not, which is not the case with all these other triangles. They just got copied over to the result mesh without any change whatsoever. But for the triangles that actually intersect the clipping plane, uh, our algorithm is sometimes splitting them into two triangles and adding a new edge to the mesh. And how does our, our algorithm know, you know, to add this new edge? It's getting that from our lookup tables that we wrote down earlier. So yeah, all in all, I'm calling this a success and that concludes this video. If you have any algorithm suggestions for future videos, whether it's mesh related or something else, feel free to leave a comment under this video. Thanks for watching and see you in the next one.